Our next presenter is Frank DeMauro, who's the son of immigrant parents from Italy and born and raised in Landisville, New Jersey. Graduated magna cum laude and received his bachelor's in accounting from Villanova University in 1995. He worked for Arthur Anderson in Philadelphia for several years before moving to New York City and taking a position as international accounting manager for HBO. In 2000, he then took a position as director of creative and business development with New York-based Shooting Gallery, a film and internet production company. In mid-2001, Shooting Gallery, Gallery filed for bankruptcy, and three months later, after losing a good friend in the tragedy of 9-11, Frank moved back to Philadelphia. In early 2002, he took a position as International Accounting Manager with Towers Pern, a global professional services firm. Frank has been with Towers Pern for almost eight years. He's currently a Regional Finance Manager overseeing the financial operations of the western part of the United States and Latin America. Frank lives in Landisville with his wife, Ilya Garcia, and their two-year-old son, Antonio. And tonight, we'll hear expert excerpts from his capstone, Strawberries in February and Son of a Barber Man, read by Richard Berman and Kitsy Watterson. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Chris. Um, as Chris pointed out, my undergraduate degree is in accounting from Villanova University. Um, I say that only because I think it's relevant as part of my MLA experience. As those of you who have either been through or are going through the MLA program know, uh, part of the application process involves a sit-down interview with the program director. Well, for me, that was Dr. Dr. Gary Purpura, and I remember sitting across from his desk, and he had my resume in one hand and my transcript from Villanova in the other. And he looked at one, and then he looked back at me, and then he, he looked at the other, and then he looked at me, and finally he placed them both down on his desk, and he said, Frank, you know what I think? I think you have your letters mixed up. I looked at him rather confused, and he continued, I don't think you should be applying to the MLA program. I think you should be applying to the MBA program over at the Wharton School. Well, I thanked Gary for looking out for me, but uh, I knew what I wanted. I knew that a broader-based education was something I wanted right after I took my first job out of college. You see, after graduating from Villanova, I took a job as an auditor for what was, at the time, the second largest accounting firm in the world. For those of you who don't know what an auditor does, an auditor is to the world of business what a referee is to the world of sports. We make sure that everybody's playing by the same rules and that they're playing honestly. Well, the very first engagement I was assigned to uh, was to audit a grant that was given by the federal government to the Children's Seashore House. The Children's Seashore House is a hospital it's around the corner from here that treats children with chronic illnesses. And my job was to ensure that the federal grant money was used to specifically provide physical rehabilitation for children suffering from cerebral palsy. That's what it stated in the grant. Well, unfortunately, when I conducted my audit, I discovered that the grant money was not used in accordance with the federal government's grant provisions. Instead of being used to provide physical therapy, the money was used to provide motorized wheelchairs for children that would have otherwise been immobile. Now, I realized, of course, that the grant money wasn't used inappropriately. It was just used incorrectly. But regardless, if I wrote that in my audit report, there was a good chance that the hospital would have lost the grant. The staff of the Children's Seashore House had uh, graciously provided me with a small conference room to do my work. And I remember sitting there, all alone, dressed in my brand new navy colored suit and my starched shirt and shiny shoes, just staring out the window and being almost angry because there was nothing in all of my business classes that I could remember that prepared me for what I consider the deeper analysis I need to deal with my very first real world on the job experience. And I found myself being torn between doing what was honest and doing what was honorable. I was always told that as you climb the educational ladder, you should always focus, focus, and specialize in that one thing that makes you an expert above and beyond everybody else. But I realized that day that there is a risk in life in developing too narrow a perspective of the world. And I didn't want to get caught up in a trap of missing the entire forest on account of a few trees. I realized that there's so many other things beyond the realm of business that I wanted to learn. Maybe the more appropriate word would be needed to learn. 
and that desire for a diverse education is what attracted me to the MLA. Well, luckily for me, Gary accepted me, but he put me on probation for the first two classes. I think he wanted to leave the door open and be able to ask me to leave in the event I turned out to be a problem student. Which, by the way, I think I did become a problem student, only at this point Gary had left and now I became Chris Pastor's problem. <laughs> I say that because uh, by the end of the MLA, whenever I would call Chris on the phone from my office, he would answer it and say, yes, Frank. <laughs> I don't know what you're going to do with all your free time, Chris. <laughs> you don't have me to bother you, but. Well, the good news is I made it. I'm here. I completed the MLA and I ended up getting a, uh, a dual concentration in environmental sustainable design and creative writing, of all things. It's a heck of a mix, especially for an accounting major. You're probably wondering how that happened. Well, to be honest, I'm still trying to figure out it myself. But I think in a way that's the real beauty of the MLA program. I think it's naive to go through life believing that your favorite candy is a Hershey's Kiss when the only type of candy you've ever eaten is a Hershey's Kiss. For me, the MLA program was kind of like a Whitman sampler. I could read the description on the inside cover of the box and then try it out and figure out whether I liked it or not. Of course, toward the end of my MLA experience, the challenge became combining these very different concentrations into a single capstone. I sat down with Professor Kitsy Watterson, she was my primary reader for uh, my capstone, and she asked me, well, how did you develop an interest in this environmental sustainability stuff? And I started to tell her about my love of biodiesel and how it all started when I almost died in the desert 10 years ago. And at that moment, I think the light bulb went off and Kitsy suggested that for my capstone, I write about my life and touch on some of those experiences that brought me to this sustainable consciousness. So while being that I've already mentioned it, I'll, I'll tell you my desert story, which is in my capstone. Um, has anyone here ever promised themselves that they were going to do something before they die? Anything, I mean, like, I don't know, jump out of an airplane or climb a mountain or something? Okay, well, maybe I'm the only person who does stuff like that. But I promised myself that one day I was going to drive cross country all the way from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. And I was working uh, in New York City for home box office at the time, and I realized that time was passing, and if I didn't do it now, I probably was never going to do it. So I requested five weeks off, and um, HBO approved it, and I set off on what was going to be an almost 8,000 mile journey around the country. Loop, come down and back. Uh, now let me frame this for you. The only vehicle I had at the time was a 15-year-old Ford Ranger pickup. Here's a picture. Let me see if I can bring this up. <laughs> That's me 10 years ago. I pulled out of my, uh, my parents' driveway on Route 40 near Atlantic City. Of course, I wasn't interested in taking an interstate road cross country because, well, I mean, what's the fun in that? The only thing you'd get to see is tractor trailers and concrete. So I bought a map of the United States from 1955, long before the interstate highways were built, and I used that as the map I used for my trip. My goal was to wind my way slowly toward California and check out some of the old forgotten towns. Now, in some cases, that meant traveling on roads that hadn't seen traffic in years. In fact, some of them had grass growing on them, as you can see in this picture. That's an actual road with grass growing through it. Well, I got as far as the deserts of southern Utah, and then my truck died. Not a good place to have a breakdown, especially in July, one of the hottest months of the year. The temperature was about 120 degrees, and uh, of course, I was on a dirt road. Um, you, you, by the way, you'd be surprised how many usable roads in the desert are just dirt. There's no concrete or asphalt. Anyway, so here I was on a dirt road in southern Utah, and since all the normal people were taking the interstate through the desert, and I wasn't fortunate to have any archaeologists traveling with me on the dirt road that day, um, I ended up being stranded there for quite a while. Um, and eventually I collapsed in the heat and passed out. The next thing I remember was an old man helping me to my feet. He handed me a bottle of water, pushed me into the hot burning bed of his pickup truck, and he drove about 60 miles and, and dumped my badly sunburnt body off at a gas station. <coughs> well, to make a long story short, the, uh, there was a small electrical component called a TFI module in the Ford Ranger's engine that had malfunctioned. 
And uh, it was known to be defective by Ford, but they had concealed it. And later there was a large class action lawsuit against them as a result of it, but I digress. But the whole experience really got me started to realize how dependent a gasoline engine is on electricity to make it work. A small electrical component can malfunction, leaving you stranded, and it's difficult to predict when an electrical part will fail. It's like looking at a light bulb and predicting when it's going to burn out. It's not an easy thing to do. And I remember thinking that there has to be a more reliable engine than this, and that, that's when I first got interested in the diesel engine. See, a diesel engine runs completely on the principle in physics that the more you compress a gas, the hotter it gets. And Rudolf Diesel was the first to discover that if you compress gas enough, it can surpass the ignition point of a fuel source and cause that fuel to spontaneously combust. Now this was the principle upon which he developed his engine. The higher compression renders spark plugs and the entire electrical system of the engine unnecessary. People somehow tend to think that diesel engines are more complicated than gasoline engines, but that's not true. Diesel engines have less moving parts. The more I learned about the simplicity and durability of the diesel engine, the more I realized I would never make a long distance trip again without one. But something else happened as a result of my studies, which was completely unexpected. I learned that Rudolf Diesel's original patent was for a compression engine that was designed to burn peanut oil. It wasn't until after his death that the patent was altered to burn petroleum-based fuels. So equipped with the knowledge of Rudolf Diesel's original idea, I brought a 1983 Mercedes Diesel for $500 as an experiment. By the way, I think I have a picture of, that's the, uh, I was eventually able to yank my <laughs> truck out of the desert and this is the guy who came and got me and that's where I broke down. You can see there's like no road there, but anyway. So for those of you who wonder what a $500 Mercedes looks like, I'm about to show you. <laughs> Not much, right? The guy who sold it to me t told me that he was either going to go home with me that day or it was going to go to the junkyard. But either way, it was going to be gone by the end of the day. Um, it actually had doors on it, though, when I got it. I, uh, I took them off as part of the restoration process. I worked on it for about six months. And uh, I got some pictures here. That's me welding a new floor in the car. And there's me painting it. And this is it when it was done. So after fixing all the rust and giving it a paint job, I asked the owner of a local restaurant if he minded me taking some of his used vegetable oil, which he gladly offered me since he had to pay to get rid of it. And which, by the way, I want to point out that, in my opinion, the most difficult part of making biodiesel is getting this used vegetable oil because I don't know if anybody's ever smelled used vegetable oil, but believe me, it's awful. If you can get through that part, then making biodiesel is a snap. Um, anyway, I filtered this oil as best I could and I dumped it in the tank and to my surprise, it worked. And it worked very well. And I was just fascinated by this. And I, and I was so excited about the prospect of being free of, of, of my dependence on foreign oil. Um, the only problem was that I, as, as I got more involved in this, I, I, I kept clogging up fuel filters. And um, also, vegetable oil has very poor cold weather properties. It'll solidify at 50 degrees. And so on a cold morning, there was no getting to work. Um, so I had to figure out a way to make it more cold weather adaptable. And in 1999, the internet was still in its infancy, but I was able to find a web forum where a few chemists and engineering professors came across the country were kind of working on the exact same thing that I was interested in. And it was from them, really, that I learned the art of transforming vegetable oil into biodiesel. Biodiesel is different from vegetable oil in that it removes the glycerin that makes the oil thick, and what you're left with is a light honey-colored liquid that burns in any diesel engine, just like diesel fuel. I, this is what it looks like. Don't get scared. It's not that dangerous. If I were to open this and throw a match inside, the match would just go out. You could actually drink it. It's less toxic than table salt. It just doesn't taste very good. But you can see how kind of honey-colored it is. <clears throat> From an environmental perspective, the difference between biodiesel and regular diesel are huge. Um, in a study conducted by the Environmental Protection Agency, they found that biodiesel has 67% less unburned hydrocarbons, 48% less carbon monoxide, 47% less particulate matter, 100% less sulfites, and 50% less ozone smog than conventional diesel. And biodiesel is not that hard to make. I mean, if an accountant can do it, anybody can, right? Um, you really only need three ingredients, vegetable oil, sodium hydroxide, and methanol. I mean, I know that sounds complicated, but you can buy this stuff pretty much anywhere. 
this is methanol. I bought this at an auto parts place. It's gas line antifreeze. Sodium hydroxide is the fancy name for drain cleaner. Bought this at a hardware store. Um, I can spend a lot of time talking about biodiesel, but I'll spare you the lesson in chemistry. Um, getting back to my capstone, um, and by the way, the title comes from another story within my capstone where I, I talk about my wife's love of strawberries and the environmental cost of getting strawberries to New Jersey in the month of February because obviously they don't grow here, so they have to come from somewhere else. So I wrote a whole story on that too. Um, and my father's a barber too, in case you were wondering. I think every <laughs> son of immigrants from Italy has a barber somewhere, so. Um, but I, before I, I, I do want to share one other story with you, um, because I promised Kitsy Watterson, who was my primary reader, uh, that I would share this with you. Um, so here goes. Uh, I'm going to take you back in time with me to 1991, when it was uh, my freshman year at Villanova. Uh, Villanova is situated on the main line, which is a very kind of old and elite section outside of Philadelphia. And for a guy like me who grew up in a very modest section of southern New Jersey, I remember being just in awe of the beautiful mansions that dotted the area uh, surrounding the campus. Um, it must have been, I think, late October. It was shortly after the leaves had dropped their leaves and you can kind of see through the branches um, that I stumbled upon what looked like an old building nestled on the, the campus's western edge. Um, I pushed my way through branches, thorns, and thickets and found what appeared to be an abandoned mansion. I was well aware that I was trespassing, but the building just seemed so odd to me. There were no cars, no artificial lights, no hanging wires that indicated a connection to the outside world, not even a noticeable driveway with access to a road. It appeared as if nature just grew around it and choked it off from the outside world. Off to the left was a stone barn with a crumbling roof and a small pond with a few geese. Cautiously, I made my way to the back of the house, and sitting on an old stone fence was an Augustinian friar reading a book. He was dressed in a capuchin robe, with a rope tied snugly around his waist, and he wore open-toed leather sandals. If it weren't for his square-rimmed glasses, you would almost think he was transported from the Middle Ages. He took notice of me and stood up. Can I help you, he asked. I'm sorry if I startled you, Father. I didn't know a father was the appropriate title to call him. I'm a student here at Villanova, and I noticed the building through the trees. I wanted to get a better look. It's beautiful. Do you, do you know who lives here? Yes, me, the friar replied. The friar went on to tell me that the house was built in 1890 by a man that made his fortune manufacturing cast iron stoves and furnaces during the Industrial Revolution. After the Great Depression, the building was abandoned and fell into disrepair. The mansion was purchased by Villanova in the 1970s, but the abandoned building was a magnet for vandalism, so the university renovated the servants' quarters in the basement, and they asked a friar from Villanova's nearby monastery. Villanova has a monastery actually on their campus, and uh, this friar was asked to live there. The friar offered to show me inside, and I was surprised by his generous hospitality and, and delighted to take the undisturbed journey back in time. I, I do have a picture of the building. That's what it looks like. It has 35 bedrooms. <laughs> I could speak at length of the fascinating details of the interior, the rich walnut floor covered in decades of dust and the cast iron fireplaces nestled in the corner of every room. But what I remember most from the impressive structure was the closets. Yes, the closets. The closets in the bedrooms were only about two feet wide. And when I opened the door, I expected to find the customary horizontal pole that you would find in pretty much any closet where you put your hangers. There was no pole. There were no hangers. Instead, the back wall of the closet was only about eight or nine inches away from the door. And on this back wall, there were two or three small hooks. Father, I asked, how did they hang their clothes in these shallow closets? On the hooks, he replied matter-of-factly. But there are only two hooks in this closet. Well, yes, one would have held their weekday outfit, and the other would hold their Sunday outfit. Fast forward with me 18 years to 2009. It's a cold and crisp January morning. My wife and I are having breakfast while reading different sections of the Sunday Enquirer. 
She lowers her section long enough to inform me that interest rates are the lowest they've been in 50 years, and that Susie Orman thinks that now is the best time to buy a house. I ask her why she thinks we need to buy another house. And she responds, well, this one's a little cramped, and it would be so nice to have a big walk-in closet. <laughs> At that very moment, I found myself being mentally transported back in time, standing next to the brown friar and staring at those two hooks in the shallow closet and wondering at what point in the last 100 years did it become socially acceptable for closets to go from two hooks on a wall to a separate room. Never before in our lifetime have more people paid more attention to our lifestyle and the threat it poses to our environment. Ice is melting, seas are rising, weather patterns are becoming erratic, and I can't help but think in some way that this is all linked to those two little hooks in the back of a small closet and how that grew into a problem so big that not even Walmart can sell us something to solve it. But then again, maybe that's the problem. What seems to be developing from the global warming movement, movement is a misconception that, we all have to, that all we have to do to avert large-scale planetary catastrophe is to make slightly different shopping choices, like buying green trash bags instead of black ones. Instead of considering green product versus a non-green product, has the buyer even asked themselves if they need the product in the first place? George Bernard Shaw once said, no question is so difficult to answer as that to which the answer is obvious. What people seem to be missing is that buying is not the solution. It's part of the problem. Building a vacation home with recycled lumber is not the answer. Perhaps the real answer is just to only own one home. And even though Macy's is offering a buy one, get two free sale, perhaps it would be best to buy one and come home with one. Stories about my life and my reflections on them is how I built my capstone. And I think it worked well to capture some of my life experiences that brought me to this sustainable consciousness in a sort of creative and entertaining spin. And speaking of spin, I think if I don't stop talking in the next 10 seconds, Chris Pastor is going to spin me right off this podium. So um, with that said, I will thank you all for your time and open it up for any questions that you might have for my capstone, uh, the MLA program in general, or biodiesel if you're so uh, interested. Um, thank you. Don't drink my biodies. <laughs> well, thanks, Frank. Does anybody have any questions for Frank? Um, you know. Are you still driving for Mercedes? Yes, I, I, I am, actually. I yeah, am. The, I, where do you get your biodies? Oh, yeah, this is, uh, I, in case people had questions on biodies, so I included this, but I wasn't going to show it. Um, yes, uh, that, that white car, I ended up driving it for about eight years. Um, and then I had a coworker just beg me for it because he fell in love with it and I and I sold it to him uh, and he had the car for three weeks and uh, a 2007 Lincoln limousine like a 40-foot limousine spun out of control hit him head-on and totaled the car so the white car is destroyed um, but in its place I bought a, a E300 Mercedes it's just it's black it's a newer model and that's what I drive and it's I I, I came to work this morning with biodiesel so yeah I get it from a I get the vegetable oil from a, a catering place that's not far from my house in South Jersey. And I went and told him that I was going to take this stuff. And he you know, looked at me like I had six heads. He thought I was crazy. But he said, yeah, if you want that stuff, man, go ahead and take it. I got to pay to get rid of it. So, uh, And it's, it's surprising to me how just one place provides me with more than enough that I need um, to do my commute. So when I have, you know, from New Jersey, it's about 80 miles round trip. So. Right, how many people on the screen know the diesel story, namely the peanut oils and the propellant in the original pattern? You know, I don't think many people know that at all. And it's funny that you say that because um, Rudolf Diesel really revolutionized the whole kind of transportation because up until this point, it was just gasoline engines, gasoline engines. And then maybe like 10, 15 years later, he invented this diesel engine. And it was like, wow, why didn't we think of this? It's such a better design. It, it produces more power. It uses less fuel. It's a much simpler design. And then he died. 
he, he washed up on the shores of the English Channel dead and nobody knows what happened to him. And then his patent was changed and that's, so I feel bad for the guy because you know he had one of the great, probably one of the greatest inventions ever and he got killed. I think we've got two great stories there. I think the diesel story and the chocolate story. Have you thought of taking those, let us say, the diesel story to American scientists and the closet story to the New Yorker? I'm an accountant. <laughs> the answer is no. Certainly the diesel story is, is brilliant material for the American scientists. And, and you would be hooked up with an editor who would uh, help you considerably with the textual and visual issues there. But the story itself has got a fabulous story. It's so calm. Well, thank you. If you know anyone that I could talk to, I'd be more than happy to get the word out there. So, But, uh, yeah, I... I um, I had a, there was the last picture there was a picture of a processor that uh, eventually I got really kind of fancy with this and I, I, I met up with a guy, it was through a friend of a friend of a friend and somebody told me, no, this guy's actually in Philadelphia and he, he sets up kind of these, because this is becoming pretty popular now, I mean, everybody wants to get on this green movement and he, he's a consultant um, that sets up these biodiesel plants and so I went and had dinner with him one night and talked about his idea and he explained a lot of things to me and I thought, well, you know, there's no reason why I couldn't make because when you look at the chemicals that are involved in temperatures, it's, it's so simple. And I thought, you know, there's no reason why I couldn't make kind of a small version of this at my house, and I, and I did. And he said, well, I have one at my house, too. And, uh, you know, simple backyard stuff. I made this little processor that I can make 25 gallons a day if I need to, but I would never use that. So I usually make 25 gallons on a weekend, and I only make it in the summer because it's easier to make in the summer because, you know, in the wintertime, you try to get the stuff, and it's too hard, and it's... But I make it throughout the summer, and then I use it throughout the year. And then the summer, I make it again, so. But you know, I, I'll talk with you, anybody who wants to talk about it after. So I don't want to take up too much time. Thank you again. Well, thanks, Frank. And, and can I say my defense that even though I inherited Frank as a problem student, I never sent him the voicemail. I do pick up, even though I recognize his number on my phone. So I'm not all bad. Um, 